go across to the guests joining us. Gurjeet Singh is former ambassador of India to countries like Germany, Indonesia, Ethiopia, ASEAN countries and the African Union. Ali Vine is senior analyst at Eurasia Group. Ben Aris, editor-in-chief, BNE and former Moscow bureau chief, Daily Telegraph is joining us. Also, Vilina Chakarova, geopolitical strategist is also with us. A big thanks to all of you for making time. Vilina, why don't I start with you? What do you see in a world that is being likened to a fractured world, a divided world, with a literal war going on in Europe. What do you see as the biggest key message emanating from this G20 summit? Thank you very much for the invitation, first and foremost. Uh, I argue that uh, this uh, particular summit uh, in India, the G20 summit in India, has uh, had the following key geopolitical uh, milestones uh, that more or less were not really anticipated in the scale and scope mm. that they took place, that they have taken place. First and foremost, joint declaration, obviously a very, very big success for Indian diplomacy. Mm. And uh, I've been witnessing the whole process uh, during the different uh, uh, summits of uh, the ministers yes. of uh, the G20 countries. It was a very, very big milestone. The second important point is that next to the European Union, African Union is going to be an institutional player representing tw uh, 55 countries. This is a big, actually big breakthrough for specifically for India, as India wants to speak for the Global South. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third important point, absolutely unexpected, I must say, and a big uh, geoeconomic breakthrough is, in fact, the announcement of uh, uh, the um, India, Gulf region, Europe corridor, which yes. is obviously an antidote of uh, China's BRI. You say that was unexpected completely, but was it? it it's been discussed and possibly you know, in hushed tones, uh, in murmurs uh, for quite some time. But are you surprised that it has actually been agreed upon, although it's just a memorandum right now? Uh, do you mean the memorandum of understanding uh, regarding the corridor or for do the you corridor. mean the joint declaration? Uh, for the of corridor. course, the corridor. Yeah. Of course, the corridor has been uh, has been uh, in uh, various talks uh, between, on the one hand, uh, Indian and uh, um, Indian representatives and uh, representatives from the Gulf uh, mm -hmm. region. And as we've known, actually, India, Israel, and the Gulf region have had a very, very significant uh, uh, diplomatic uh, talks, specifically when it comes to trade uh, relationship. On the other hand, of course, India, Europe has witnessed a very, very big. Uh, uh, success in terms of the relaunch of the FTA, of the Free uh, Trade Agreement. So in a sense, there have been a lot of talks and I have been to Greece when uh, Prime Minister Modi was uh, uh, was visiting the country and was in conversations with uh, uh, with uh, Prime Minister Mitsutaki. So right now, we understand also that certainly the role of uh, the Port Piraeus has been uh, part of the conversations mm -hmm. because this will be one of the key uh, ports that will connect uh, India, Gulf region with Europe. And, uh, you know, since you touched that point, let me also ask you about Italy's move to potentially leave the BRI. And we are being told, at least via some uh, news portals, is that that communication has happened on the sidelines of the G20 by uh, 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 Ms. Maloney. So, do you see a shift happening in how the world is viewing a partnership with India versus a partnership with China? Absolutely. I've been also to India at the Rezina dialogue when Prime Minister Modi, uh, Modi actually hosted uh, uh, PM uh, Meloni. Yes. Uh, she was uh, the inauguration guest uh, and uh, this uh, relationship took off from there and we see already the first fruits uh, with uh, the decision of Italy. I think that it is very much due to this personal relationship between the two prime ministers that now Italy is considering to exit uh, China's BRI. By the way, Italy has been the only G7 country mm -hmm. that actually has signed a memorandum of understanding with China to be part of the BRI. So this is a critical, uh, critical, uh, I think, milestone in the not only bilateral relationship with India, but also when it comes to this uh, big uh, competition right now between the United States and China yes. in terms of connectivity, in terms of uh, uh, trade, uh, infrastructure, corridors, connectivity, because right now India has also its own, let's say, uh, idea and vision about uh, alternative uh, corridors. And this, of course, should be uh, one way how to prevent another, let's say, Cold War 2.0 or uh, bipolarity from happening between United States and China.
Yes, and of course, India has its own concerns vis-a-vis -vis China too. But before I go uh, further on the issue of China, Ben Arias, I want to understand from you how Russia is looking at the joint declaration. This was seemingly impossible, but a language was agreed upon and it was indeed adopted. There is no specific mention of Russia, but the language is still talking about the same universal principles that many countries have highlighted in the past, including India. Uh, what's the Russian sense on the joint declaration, particularly on the Russia-Ukraine war? I think Russia, the Kremlin, was very happy with it, in so much as, as you say, the watered-down language of the declaration was extremely weak, and it was like the lightest rebuke that possibly could come, in so much as the declaration talked about, quote-unquote, all states, didn't mention Russia by name at all, and it talked about the war in Ukraine. The Ukrainian foreign ministry protested yes. and said it should have been the war against Ukraine. And so uh, for Russia, I mean, it was expecting some sort of condemnation um, from the, the G20 participants. But it got off extremely lightly. Uh, and so the Kremlin, I think, has been very happy with that. Uh, it's a result of, um, the, I mean, the, the, the weak language hmm. highlights the divisions within the G20, within the BRICS plus the expanded Emerging Markets Club that some people like the Chinese and the Russians, um, they wanted to see it as a political tool in order to confront the West, whereas other members, uh, more dovish members like South Africa and India, they want to see the, these bodies, the G20 plus the, the new BRICS plus, um, more as cooperative um, lobbying groups where the emerging markets, Global South, Hmm. can make themselves heard, but they don't want to go into conflict. Hmm. And so for, for Mali, getting the declaration through, getting a condemnation through at all, in that very diversified set of views, hmm. was a huge diplomatic coup. But at the end of the day, it could have been stronger. And as I say, the uh, Ukrainian foreign minister, uh, they complained bitterly and said it, it didn't go nearly far enough. Hmm. Uh, just co in continuation to that, a lot of the countries uh, that were, of course, part of the G20, in their individual communications and, uh, you know, their briefings to the media, they did use much harsher words on the war in Ukraine by Russia or the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as they would like to call it. Uh, so the fact that they were still there, they hold uh, very close their views uh, on the position of Russia and Ukraine. Uh, do you still see as it, uh, this being a positive development that at least in a multilateral forum like the G20, the Russia-Ukraine conflict didn't completely hijack everything else and a, a, a declaration was possible? Yeah, indeed. I mean, you've got two things going on here. One is that the Global South, like the African Union's just joined um, with the G20. That brings them to the top table with a voice in uh, geopolitics, international geopolitics. Mm. And as members of, responsible members of the global community that actually want to say in how the world is run, then they all need to have a position on this war um, if they're going to comment on international politics. Mm. But on the other side, um, they see, I think most of the Global South see this as a European fight mm. between Russia and, uh, and Europe and, and Ukraine and really nothing to do with them. Uh, and they would rather sit on the fence and not get sucked into it, not get involved, not supply arms, but continue to do trade and get investment and develop. And so this leads to them sort of offering a rather weak statement. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to do anything. Hmm. I mean, none of those Global South countries have joined in sanctions. Um, they're just ignoring them. Hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's a difficult balance that they're trying to, to, to strike. Um, we had Sir Cyril Ramposa, the, the president of South Africa in Kiev, who was offering a peace plan. I think this is the first time we've seen hmm an African president in Europe offering peace plans for yes. a European or international problem. So they're beginning to get involved, but his peace plan was, you know, it was a bit of a, uh, um, how should I say, a bodged job. Uh, it was d dismissed out of hand. So they're very new at this and they're not very good at it. And really no one's really paying that much attention. Hmm. But the point being is that they're all in play now and they have to have positions on these things. Right. And that was the, what the declaration was.